Okay, hello everybody, welcome back. We left off last time talking about the wage gap, uh, and today we're gonna to talk about labor market discrimination. And when we left off talking about the wage gap, we are looking at what would happen if we hold all else equal, meaning we assume that no other factors vary by gender. So if you remember, for instance, this uh, data we were looking at before, right? we were adding controls kind of along the way and we said, all right, well, if we say that uh, education and years of experience don't vary by gender, if we say that uh, gendered occupational differences are all equal, if we uh, say that, okay, men and women are working in the same types of companies, and if we say, okay, imagine men and women are getting the same types of jobs, same types of promotions, then the wage gap, if we hold all these things equal, if we statistically say that all of these things uh, are the same between genders, then the wage gap shrinks to be about 7.4%, right? Meaning women make 7.4% less than men still, even if we hold all these things constant. Uh, and we talked about how most economists would say that 7.4% uh, we can attribute to some type of discrimination. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, this slide that we were just looking at, this is more just kind of explaining what I had just talked about, right? We're using econometrics, which is a field of economics that thinks about uh, statistics and statistical models. Uh, and we're using econometrics to help us see how men and women's wages would differ if all else equal, right? Assuming that there are no other factors that varied by gender. So that's, again, what we're kind of doing over here in this, uh, in this data. So what is discrimination before we kind of think about different economic theories of discrimination? Well, labor market discrimination refers to two equally qualified individuals being treated differently on the basis of an arbitrary category. We're largely going to be talking about gender discrimination in the labor market, right? But you could also imagine uh, discrimination based on race, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, things like this age, right, all kinds of different things. So we're going to first look at some mainstream economist theories of discrimination and then go to some more heterodox and feminist theories of discrimination. Starting with the mainstream theories, let's look at this taste-based discrimination and then we'll look at the statistical discrimination. So taste-based discrimination is something that Gary Becker came up with. And Gary Becker said, okay, well, some people some firms just have a taste for discrimination, meaning they dislike a certain group of people for some personal reason, right? He doesn't really try to figure out why, he just says they dislike a group of people for some personal reason, and this is going to influence their economic decisions. And we'll look at several different groups that can have a taste for discrimination. We'll start with employers. So how would an employer decide between hiring these two employees, this woman on the left and this man on the right? Well, uh, let's assume that employers are always going to just hire the least expensive of the two equally qualified workers because they want to maximize profits, right? They're going to hire whoever uh, has a kind of the lower requested salary. We're assuming that these two individuals are just equally productive, equally competent. So let's say that they both are requesting the same salary. They're both requesting a $45,000 annual salary. But what if the employer dislikes hiring women, has this taste for discrimination? In this case, Becker says that then maybe the men would be cheaper to hire than the women. And this is because the employer uh, would incur some kind of psychological cost, as Becker puts it. And we could say, okay, maybe there's some psychological cost associated with hiring this group of people that this employer doesn't like. In this example, women, right? And so they're going to add that psychological cost to the individual's uh, salary, right? To whatever they feel like they're going to have to pay the individual to work there. And so the employer may not hire women or may pay them less if the psychological cost of hiring a woman is high, right? And so here we have an example where the psychological cost of hiring this woman on the left is an additional $1,200, right? Again, this is kind of a funny example where economists are putting um, numbers, putting dollar values on things that are pretty hard to put a dollar value on, but this is the general idea. 
But will this discrimination persist in labor markets if employers are being discriminatory? Like, will that still continue in labor markets? Um, probably not, right? But only if uh, discriminators have many non-discriminatory competitors, which force them to keep costs low to pay standard wages. Uh, and if workers know they have options, right? And so basically, if we're in a competitive environment, right, we're in a competitive environment where you can't afford to be discriminatory, right? You're going to lose out um, on some, some good workers if you decide to be discriminatory. Uh, and if workers know they have options, right? It's a competitive environment for workers as well, right? So if you uh, come across someone who might be discriminatory, if workers have options, that means workers can just decide not to work there and work somewhere else, right? So this is the idea. But what if there's a different group of people who have this taste for discrimination? So what if it's the employees? So what happens if a male employee dislikes working with women? Well, we know that workers have some kind of reservation wage, which is just kind of a fancy economist way of saying that it's the minimum level of pay that they'd be willing to accept to work at that job. So let's say they both have the same initial reservation salary. Both the female worker on this left side and the male worker on the right side are uh, only willing to work at this job if they get paid at least $45,000. But let's say that this man on the right has some psychological cost, again, uh, that he will incur by working with a group of people that he doesn't like, that he has a taste for discrimination for. So his uh, reservation wage is going to be even higher, right, because we're going to tack on that psychological cost that he's feeling. So he's now saying, okay, I'm not willing to work for this company unless I get paid $45,000 plus whatever is covering my psychological cost, right? Here we're saying his psychological cost is $2,000. So he needs to be paid $47,000 total in order to be willing to work at this job. Uh, and so he would ask for this higher pay, right? And so it's kind of tricky to think about what's going to happen here, right? Maybe... Uh, because firms are only looking to kind of keep things cheap, they'll say, okay, well, we're not going to pay you $47,000 if this woman who's equally qualified is willing to work for $45,000. Uh, so he might not get hired. But alternatively, you can imagine a situation in which maybe it's a male-dominated field. A lot of men are already working in this field, already working in this workplace, uh, and then kind of introducing a new group of people, for instance, women, uh, might kind of raise the psychological cost and then their, their salaries down the line. Now, another type of uh, a group of people that could have this taste for discrimination that Becker talks about is, is customers, right? So what happens if customers dislike working with women? Well, it's the same idea here, right? Customers perceive the price of the service as the sticker cost, right? Whatever you're told is the price of the service. Plus, again, this like psychological price or this psychological cost that we keep referring to. So if someone's uh, charging you to do this service and they're charging $50 an hour, uh, and then maybe the customer has this perceived psychological cost where they it's costly for them right, to, to work with someone they don't like, right? And so they might say, okay, well, this is actually going to cost me more than this $50, right? It's costing me the $50 per hour plus this psychological cost that I am accruing because I don't like working with this type of person. Um, the problem with this, though, is that the quantity demanded by customers is going to be lower, right? Because they're going to say, well, why would I pay this $50 per hour plus this cost, psychological cost on top of it when I could go get the same service from somebody else and pay just the $50, right? And so people might not uh, go demand services from women or from whatever group of people they're discriminating against, um, which is, right, reducing this quantity demanded. Uh, and would maybe even kind of uh, lead people to think that women are less productive, right? If customers are not willing to buy from women or get services from women or from certain groups, um, then people might deem those groups as less productive. And so will this employee or customer-driven discrimination go away and kind of naturally in labor markets, like in the case of uh, employer discrimination? Well, not necessarily, right? Employers have a strong incentive to meet the demands of even discriminatory customers, right? If customers uh, are telling business owners that they don't want to work with certain types of people, um, there's not a lot of incentive to, to kind of go against these customers' wishes, right? And you can 
Think about the same thing even with employees. Okay, so that's the taste for discrimination stuff. Now let's talk about the second uh, kind of neoclassical mainstream theory of uh, discrimination. So here we're talking about statistical discrimination. So how could discrimin emer discrimination emerge if people don't have a taste for discrimination, right? They are generally kind of good, well-meaning people uh, and don't, you know, just dislike a certain group of people for some reason. Um, but we still see some level of discrimination. And, and how does that happen? So what if employers hold beliefs about how productive or how costly women are on average? For instance, you could think about the case uh, of a worker's likelihood at staying at a job, right? They could say, okay, well, what if uh, I, I hire this woman and she decides to leave the labor force because she has a kid, right? And she wants to go take care of her child. So I, as the employer, might say, okay, well, I think maybe this woman might only stay at this job for five years, but I know that men are less likely to quit their jobs or less likely to take paternity leave or less likely to care for their, for their children. Uh, and so I, I might assume that like this man, on the other hand, would stay for longer, maybe 10 years instead of five years. Uh, and so the individual employer might treat all individual women according to that belief, right? Despite the fact that we don't really know if this woman uh, intends on only staying five years or not, right? So what does this mean for employers' profits? Well, if the generalization is wrong, employers lose out on a great hire, right? You lost out on a woman that you that might have been a great employee. Uh, but the gains of the statistical discrimination might be pretty high, right? If the generalization is correct uh, and you decide not to hire a woman because you think that she will leave the labor force in a few years after she has a child, um, but you didn't kind of miss out on that, right? You uh, ended up deciding against that, you ended up hiring somebody else um, and not kind of losing this employee, right? Uh, the problem with this though, aside from just kind of uh, generalizing about an entire group of people, uh, is that there's some, some feedback effects, right? So here, uh, if there's some kind of statistical discrimination, so let's again think about this idea of uh, employers assuming that women will leave the labor force to take care of their children. Uh, so they have this statistic in mind, they know that this is statistically what happens, uh, and so they decide not to promote women, right? They say, well, I don't want this woman in a leadership position because she might leave in a few years. Um, which eventually is going to give rise to less incentive for women to work, right? Again, let's go back to our Gary Becker comparative advantage household division of labor arguments, right? If uh, there's a, a woman and a man and there's a lot of just general statistical discrimination about women, um, then the woman who might not get these promotion opportunities will probably be pay getting paid less than her maybe male partner, right? And so uh, in this case, there's going to be less incentive for her to work, more incentive for her to stay at home, right? If we're thinking about this idea of specializing in labor, household labor or market work. Um, so if she's encouraged to stay home, then this feeds right back into this like statistic that the employers are thinking about in the first place, right? If she decides to stay home, then she has this lower uh, labor force attachment, which again feeds into uh, the exact statistic that we were starting with that kind of led to this entire discrimination in the first place. Uh, so it is extremely problematic and that uh, while these people are well-intentioned and not uh, necessarily discriminating, discriminating against people just because of their gender, um, there, there's these important feedback loops, right? Okay, so those are the two main uh, kind of mainstream or neoclassical explanations about gender discrimination. Feminist and heterodox theories of discrimination tend to see discrimination much more broadly. Um, so this first kind of general argument is that feminists would say that discrimination is a process that affects uh, many interrelated outcomes, right? So they might say that um, okay, well, like a lot of these other things that we tried to hold constant when looking at the data, for instance, occupational segregation, differences in education, right? These uh, differences are a result of discrimination that happens earlier on in the process, right? So maybe, uh, for instance, girls and women don't go into things like engineering, right? Because they feel like they might be discriminated against in that major and then eventually in the job, right? And so there's uh, some types of discrimination that, that generally they're saying occur earlier. Um, 
right? And discrimination, and this is the second one I'll talk about when we talk about Barbara Bergman's theory, um, discrimination can persist because of its, its benefits to a certain group. Um, so let's think about this discrimination as a process in a little bit more detail before we do that, right? So mainstream economists view discrimination as kind of a residual or a leftover difference, this all else equal thing, right? That 7.4% thing that we were looking at in that data before. But again, feminist economists would say that discrimination is actually more of an ongoing process, right? If women are stereotyped, for instance, to be nurturers, right, then maybe they'll go into care work, right? And care work is typically paid less, which might contribute to the gender wage gap. So feminists would say, okay, well, if we control for these differences in occupation, that's ignoring the role of initial stereotypes and initial types of discrimination. Whereas more mainstream economists would say, no, no, those are just um, kind of individual tastes and preferences. Those don't have anything to do with discrimination, right? The discrimination is that leftover part once we hold all else equal. Whereas the feminists, again, might say, well, no, discrimination is an ongoing process, right? We see this along uh, all these different kind of types of uh, job making decisions. Um, and again, neoclassical theory kind of suggests that in many cases, right, particularly if the employer is being discriminatory, um, discrimination is costly, right, and it'll go away over time and go away with competition. But feminist economists see discrimination uh, as a use of power generally to maintain some kind of group benefits and that competition in the market will not necessarily eliminate this. And this is what Barbara Bergman is talking about in her occupational crowding hypothesis. So let's talk about that. Uh, Bergman's occupational crowding hypothesis suggests that women and minorities are crowded into low-paying occupations and purposely excluded from other occupations, right? And she says that the reason that this is the case, right, the reason that women and minorities are kind of pushed into these lower-paying occupations and excluded from higher-paying occupations is to keep the wages high in certain types of occupations for certain types of groups. So if you think about just like basic supply and demand, right, if you reduce the supply of workers who are available to work in a certain occupation, this is going to raise the price of labor, meaning wages. So if there are certain types of jobs that are only restricted to white people or only restricted to women, uh, sorry, excuse me, only restricted to men, um, then there's not a whole pool of other people kind of competing for the same job, and so wages are going to stay kind of artificially high. Uh, and there's some kind of examples of this. Um, the occupational crowding hypothesis was actually first kind of conceptualized in the 1800s, uh, largely because I think there's a lot of like very clear um, acts that were kind of contributing to this, right? Unions in the 1800s, for instance, resisted allowing women uh, to join union memberships and to certain types of employment. For instance, the National Typographer, uh, Typographical Union sorry, um, chose not to, quote, encourage by its act the employment of female uh, um, workers, essentially, right? Um, a cigar makers international union kind of more clearly says we cannot drive out the, the females out of the trade, uh, but we can restrict their daily quota of labor through factory laws, right? So these are some examples of just kind of certain types of industries excluding women from uh, from their jobs, right? And so that way the men uh, might get paid more. So we can talk about this more if folks are interested, um, but these are the, the main takeaways I'd like you to get, right? So understand this taste-based discrimination thing. Um, think about how competition might kind of reduce this discrimination. Think about statistical discrimination, the feedback effects. Uh, understand discrimination as a process and also understand Bergman's occupational crowding hypothesis. Um, feel free to ask me any questions you have about any of these and uh, otherwise I'll see you folks next time.